In a small corner of the southwest of Western Australia, a tiny community is living in the shadow of an American corporate giant. It's like a hell on wheels here. It's like living in a toxic bubble. This is the town of Yarloop, which nestles quietly next to the Darling Ranges. Nearby, a giant alumina refinery towers over the landscape. The refinery's opponents say the plant's emissions are making people sick. I've been having nosebleeds, um, skin rashes, kind of like blisters that ulcerate, um, hair a lot thinner, lethargy. The company insists the plant is safe and poses no health risk to the local community. Now it wants to double the refinery's output. In a battle like many around the world, residents find their personal health experiences at odds with the company's scientific claims. We apply best practice, world-class science in our, in our understanding of our emissions, and that's where we're very confident that uh, the refineries are in fact safe. We want the truth in this. We want to know what, what has uh, we've been exposed to. Uh, we want to know what those long-term health effects are. Tonight on Four Corners, a parable for the industrial age. The tale of the small community of Yarloop fighting to survive, the giant industry on its doorstep, and the battle to get at the truth of what's out there. If ever there was a metal for the modern age, it's aluminium. We drink from it in cans, we use it to build homes and warehouses. It transports us around the world in aeroplanes. It's an essential part of our high-speed, fast-food lifestyle, and it has to be made somewhere. Aluminium is the most abundant metal element in the Earth's crust. Much of it originates here, in the red soil underneath the Jarrah forests of the Darling Ranges in Western Australia. Here, bauxite is mined and transported down to refineries where it's processed into alumina, a fine white powder and the basis of the finished metal. Aluminium is light and durable, and it's recycled again and again. But making the metal in the first place is more greedy than green. The process is greedy for energy, greedy for water, greedy for natural resources. The alumina industry consumes approximately half of the northwest shelf gas that uh, comes through uh, on the Dampier pipeline. Um, as well as using vast amounts of fresh water, which is becoming increasingly scarce. So it's always been a very controversial industry. Indeed, the 1978 approval of a new alumina plant here was in itself controversial. Protesters opposing the mining of the Jarrah Forest tried to stop the bulldozers. They failed. The plant was built and became the third alumina refinery in Western Australia owned through its Australian subsidiary by the same American company, Alcoa. Alcoa is a major world player. It's a big contributor to the state economy, but its relationship with successive state governments has also proved controversial. The state agreement acts that it operates under um, have enormous advantages to the company. For example, um, its royalty base is very low indeed. We haven't got the best bauxite in the world, but we offer a really good deal here for big companies. Um, we offer stability um, and we offer uh, state governments that will bend over backwards to allow these kind of uh, big um, big enterprises uh, to be established and to enjoy stability. Of today's earnings, 80 cents 
of every revenue dollar, export revenue dollar, actually stays in Australia. Um, it's paid out either in dividends here, in taxes, uh, in wages and salaries, purchase of materials and, and services. Stability, though, is the one thing that's eluded the local communities living in the shadow of the huge refinery. The town of Wagerup, where the plant was built, has simply disappeared, though the name itself survives. And the future of Yaloup is now in serious question. I hope that everybody realises that Alcoa is the future of West. I think Alcoa has divided the community something shocking. We don't have any issues with our car. We've never smelt anything in the 18 months that we live here. I've been living in Yarloop for 54 years, 40 years in this house, and all what our car had given me was a headache. I've um, lived in Yarloop all my life, born and bred, and I think all this hoo-ha is just rubbish. Yarloop lies a few hundred metres off the road from Perth to Bunbury. Here, the workshops which once served the largest timber centre in the world are now a museum. A century ago, the largest private rail system in Australia hauled out massive jarrah logs from here and shipped them far afield to England, China, India and South Africa. It was a mighty industry worthy of record. Today, the timber industry here survives, though on nothing like the same scale. Yaloup now is a sleepy little town, perfect, you would think, for those who want to retire or simply enjoy a quiet life. It's just such a nice, quiet little town, you know, and it's not far from Bunbury or Perth, and it's just in the middle, and it's... There's not been a lot of crime and corruption in the place. It's just... Peaceful. There's, there's some good ones Some here. good ones there. Our parents have made a mess again. Mm -hmm. That seemed to be eaten all our through. Yaloup has a strong contingent of Italian families, many of whom first arrived in search of work in the 1930s and 40s. Most of them would be uh, just ordinary labourers from, uh, from the south of Italy. And they did it hard. There's no question about that. We were a dairy community with beef and vegetables. And I remember growing up, it was great. You knew everyone, dairy farms every, cows every. It was great. Some townspeople, like former real estate rep Greta Golubic, moved to Yaloup to fulfil the dream of living in a country community. It's got everything here, shops, hotel, bowling club, hospital, police station, a school. It's green, it's got cows, it's birds, it's just, it's a beautiful little town, you know, and I thought this is the place where I'll, I'll stay forever and just do it up and become part of the community. Most of Yarloop welcomed the arrival of Alcoa. For some, it meant jobs and the prospect of a secure future. I joined Alcoa in uh, 1984, February 1984, and uh, I've been there ever since. Um, great employers, uh, a yeah, great company to work for. It was an uh, interesting, big company, good money, uh, good time off, it was great. Everybody was happy, and basically a lot of people were to wear the Alcoa logo. So why did it change? I guess with the increase of production with the second and third stage, then the emissions come along, and that happened around 1996. And uh, from that point on, the groups were formed in order to uh, get some sort of answer from Alcoa and the government. The issues around the refinery's emissions and their health effects began in 1996, when a liquor owner, one of only four in the world's alumina industry, was installed at the plant. The liquor burner is designed to remove organic matter from the caustic soda used in the production process. This cleaning helps improve the quality and quantity of the alumina produced. 
In burning off this organic material, volatile organic compounds are emitted, as well as carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and oxides of nitrogen. The emissions have a distinctive odor, which those who work at Wager Up are familiar with. The liquor burner gave off a smell, a bad smell, but it didn't really do anything to you, or we thought them days. And generally, long I worked there, being a chef fitter, the smell started affecting me. Michael DeRosa, who worked as a mechanical fitter at the plant, suffered multiple symptoms after the liquor burner came on stream. He's been doubly unlucky. He now, in addition, has multiple sclerosis, which can't be laid at Alcoa's door. I started getting crook like headaches, and the headaches uh, become blood noses, and I started throwing up. When did you first start experiencing symptoms that, that started worrying you? Um, late uh, 1997. Um, I started getting some symptoms and then gradually more symptoms came in. What were they? Um, headaches, nauseous, um, sore eyes, sore eyes um, mm. skin irritation. Jan Jovanovic, who works at Yalup's nine-bed hospital, also started feeling ill after the liquor burner was installed. But her husband, a loyal refinery employee, found it hard to credit. You were a good Alcoa company man. How did you react? I didn't believe Jan. I was uh, a little bit uh, negative uh, towards her uh, sickness. Uh, I didn't think it was Alcoa at all. Um, I was a little bit amiss, and I'm deeply sorry, you know, to do that. The liquor burner's fumes the wager up workers believed were making them ill. One by one, these men sought help from doctors in Perth, including occupational physician and former professor, Dr. Andrew Harper, who has extensive experience in the field of chemical injury. Are you in any doubt why they became ill? No, I'm not in any doubt about that. No, I'm not. I think that the, the uh, chemical uh, emissions uh, have caused their illness. Uh, there's been no indication of any other medical problems uh, at the time that these people got sick. They were fully investigated medically for all other possible causes. And their problem started with exposure to emissions. So they had notable events associated with, uh, with chemical exposure at the workplace and that, would, that heralded the, the beginning of symptoms. Many of the Yaloop residents who fell sick saw Perth GP Dr Moira Summers. There's the group of people, mostly residents, um, who presented with um, irritant symptoms. That's um, symptoms relating to sore, watery, runny eyes, um, sore throat, um, sore nose, um, blood noses and cough, and in some cases the onset of asthma, and um, certainly saw several people who had problems with their skin, uh, rashes. A second group, however, even more serious signs of illness. The main symptoms are um, basically fatigue and mental confusion, um, blunting of mental function, um, muscle aches and pains, symptoms related to all their systems, some palpitations, some genitourinary problems, some abdominal problems, um, just a wide-ranging set of symptoms. One of those who says the odour seriously affected him is Alex Jovanovic, who hadn't believed his wife when she told him previously she was feeling ill from the emissions. About four years ago, I got a blackout, and I happened to be at, be at work. Um, I didn't sort of pass out, but uh, I lost my speech. Uh, I knew where I was. It was uh, fairly embarrassing. Uh, I didn't tell anyone. You know, um, it sort of went. And about three, four months later, I was here at home, had exactly the same symptom again. Uh, and this is after I could smell uh, the, uh, the odour. And I came in here and um, I tried to speak to, to Jan. I couldn't speak. I was just speaking gobbledygook. 
In several of the most serious cases they saw, the doctor's diagnosis was multiple chemical sensitivity, a chronic condition which results from exposure to a range of chemicals, often at low doses. The existence and nature of the condition is hotly debated in medical, legal and industrial relations circles. The advice we've had uh, is that it's not a, an accepted mainstream uh, diagnosis. This is a, a label which has been used since about 1986 or something thereabouts. Uh, this is a, a descriptor which describes people who have got certain patterns of symptoms. Uh, it's not a label that has got any diagnostic tests attached to it. It's not a label for which there are any particular physical signs. Alcoa insists that up to 6% of any population manifest symptoms of multiple chemical sensitivity no matter where they live. It's a very vexed issue um, and we've responded in the best way we could um, in, uh, uh, at wager up uh, to that issue. Alcoa's response to this, I think, has been very bad. I think it's been atrocious. If we've got a responsible employer and you've got people who are complaining of illness and you've got thoroughly genuine employees who continue to get sick at the workplace, they're people that you should believe. My experience with this has been that for approximately five years, maybe it's a little less than that, Alcoa's response was one of stubborn denial of there to be a problem. What did the other doctors hired by Alcoa tell you? Oh, I was uh, psychosomatic. I was basically a nutcase and uh, I hated Alcoa and uh, uh, things I did in earlier life probably making me ill and Alcoa was a clean environment, did everything right basically. They weren't at fault. It was, it was me. I was mad, basically. In 1997, Alcoa turned off the liquor burner for six months. Emissions control equipment was fitted, and in 2002, the height of the stacks was increased to 100 metres in order to send the emissions higher into the atmosphere. The company now admits that the emission caused problems, but insists that any health effects were short-term and reversible. The emissions from the liquor burner were an irritant, which affected quite a number of people, and in most cases a short-term irritant and reversible in that sense. We switched it off in 1997 after being unable to uh, successfully complete uh, commissioning of it, um, and we only brought it back online when we had when technology was in fact available to uh, deal with the uh, level of, uh, of irritants and, and odour from the unit. All I really know about the Alcoa wager up plant with regard to health is that it has, it has made a number of workers ill. Certainly not all of the workers, but there have been a number who have been, become significantly ill. The symptoms endured by employees like Michael DeRosa were certainly significant, and in his case, his sensitivity to chemicals has lasted. Even so, it was a battle for him and his colleagues to reach any sort of settlement with Alcoa. But in 2001, five years after the liquor burner was commissioned, a circuit breaker emerged. A new forum was set up by the state government to listen to the community's concerns. That forum, which was uh, comprised doctors, employees of the state, uh, people from Alcoa, there was unanimous agreement that the men were ill. And there was unanimous agreement that their problem related to, it was associated with Alcoa. They basically were the first uh, official group, if you like, which actually said to this community, we believe you. The outcome for the men who worked at Wager Up was positive. With the help of their union, they secured substantial payouts, but Alcoa denied any liability for their illnesses. 
We negotiated a settlement for those individuals involved with their union at the time, uh, which involved a payment of 350000 to them. It was to allow them to get on with their life um, and uh, attend to future training or, or rehabilitation needs. Uh, I think it provided a circuit breaker for us to also move forward and put that episode uh, behind us. So that's the background behind the payments. Does the $350,000 compensate for what happened to you? No, <laughs> not by a long shot. You know, we, we accept, we failed the community. We're not proud of what happened in 1996. Uh, it is not how we like to operate our facilities. But now sees the episode with the liquor burner as one it would like to put to rest. The company says that if it's allowed to double the output at wager up, some emissions will increase. The pollution will only get worse, won't it? No, the expansion proposed, uh, in fact, is looking at new technology, it's looking at making the refinery more efficient, uh, and we're able to guarantee that there will not be adverse effects from any expansion. We would not even contemplate um, expansion of the refinery if we weren't able to uh, achieve that. And that's a, uh, a, a commitment we're making to the community. I think it was totally irresponsible to consider an expansion of this refinery while people are being still uh, impacted uh, with, and still experiencing considerable health problems. It's ridiculous. How can we think that uh, a, a refinery can be virtually doubled in throughput and that there will be no increase in emissions and therefore no increase in health impacts? It is Former Greens MLC Chrissy Sharp headed a three-year parliamentary inquiry into WagerUp. She believes much more work needs to be done to understand the unique meteorological conditions there. These conditions allow plumes of chemical emissions from the plant to settle at or near ground level. It's known the Darling Escarpment, you get particular local winds. Um, and that effectively the air shed at, uh, over the refinery at Wagerup doesn't behave um, as you would expect uh, the air models uh, pre predict um, because there simply is uh, under certain weather conditions not the energy in the atmosphere to effectively disperse the plume. Well, any site um, along the scarp will have different uh, meteorological uh, characteristics. I'm not sure that there's anything specifically unique about um, uh, wager up in its sense. Some residents say they've been caught in these plumes of pollution. Very few photographs of them exist. These pictures show one such reported event. I was returning home from work at around about 7 p.m. and saw what to me was a very unusual cloud formation right on the ground uh, in a paddock just up the road from here. Um, and I stopped to photograph it. Uh, and then when I got further up the road um, to the trees, I could see through the trees that this cloud actually extended all the way back to the stacks at the refinery. This one particular morning, there was a breeze came through my bedroom window. I'm lying there and it, the breeze smelt like exhaust fumes. And I jumped up and I walked out my veranda and I saw the plume in front of me. It was hovering a railway line. It was huge, it was massive. There was a top and a bottom to it. And it, it just sat there. And as soon as I walked out that door, my face was just, it felt like someone threw a match on me. My eyes were burning, my nose, the inside of my nose, my mouth, my throat. I got up, um, went out to feed the lorikeet, just put two steps out the door. Carol Dyson and her husband Kingsley moved to the nearby town of Cookinup in 2003. And I began to feel that my breathing was constricted and it got worse. My throat blew up and um, I was in distress in, the, in a very short, in a few seconds and came back inside. Significantly, both Carol Dyson and Greta Golubic began to experience their symptoms well after Alcoa says it had solved the problem at WagerUp by building taller stacks and introducing emission controls. Carol Dyson was diagnosed as suffering from multiple chemical sensitivity by Dr. Summers, who blames the emissions from WagerUp. 
this particular person was was very unwell and um, it seemed in her best interest to move. So I did advise her to do that. Her medical advice was not to live here anymore and to leave. I get muddled when I use spray um, window cleaner and things like that and I just feel shocking and drained of energy for days after and um, she just advised me not to use chemicals anymore to take every chemical we've got out of the place and not use it. The challenge for anyone in Yaloop who has fallen sick is how can they prove the refinery made them ill? Alcoa's own report to the National Pollutant Inventory shows that last year large quant chemicals were emitted from the plant. 64 kilograms of arsenic, a kilogram of beryllium, 580,000 kilograms of carbon monoxide, 18,000 kilograms of formaldehyde, 290 kilograms of mercury, 27 kilograms of selenium, 55,000 kilograms of sulfur dioxide, 1.1 million kilograms of oxides of nitrogen, 150,000 kilograms of volatile compounds. Arsenic, beryllium, formaldehyde, those are dangerous chemicals, aren't they? Yes, well, they are in terms of uh, the chemicals themselves, but you've got to look at the quantities in which they are emitted um, and the concentrations uh, in the receiving environment. And, and that's where we can be very, very sure that they pose no risk. The refineries are, in fact, safe. The state government's environment department says more than a billion tonnes a year of greenhouse gases will be produced by the refinery if the expansion at Wager Up proceeds. Emissions of volatile organic compounds, sulphur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen will also go up. What we know about air quality in the region, it is very much typical of a rural environment and, and significantly better than the, than the air quality you would find in, in Perth um, or in the suburbs of Perth. Alcoa says that identifying particular chemicals which might be making people ill is simply too hard to do. What we understand from research into multiple chemical sensitivity is that people have not been able to isolate particular chemicals or, or concentrations of chemicals uh, that would trigger or cause such a condition. So it's, it's an unknown or it's a very vexed argument to try and go down that path. But a consultant scientist who's working with the community is determined to do just that. Jeff Payne has a PhD in chemistry and is the founder of Scientists for Labor. He believes particular chemicals in minute amounts may be causing multiple chemical sensitivity and triggering the headaches reported by workers and residents after breathing in the odor from the plant. That sort of symptom may be due to the uh, trace elements of nitro compounds, for example. It's just a hypothesis at the moment. But, um, that sort of compound is capable of inducing uh, violent changes in your blood pressure, which in, in turn can cause uh, headache symptoms and so on. I'm also recently interested in the possibility that the multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome may actually trace back to um, some uh, compounds such as beryllium or formaldehyde, because both of those um, uh, chemicals sensitize us formaldehyde is um, a known carcinogen. It's one of um, five toxics which has national priority um, and wager up is emitting um, over 50 kilograms per day average um, of formaldehyde. Alcoa's critics believe that not enough work has been done to establish whether in combination this chemical cocktail of emissions really is safe. You're talking here at least 261 uh, compounds, VOCs, heavy metals and so on that are emitted all the time by the refinery. Uh, mercury is one of them. Arsenic is another one that's been pinpointed. Um, there is a very long list of, of known toxic or carcinogenic substances which are, which are regularly emitted and yet exactly what combination it is uh, with making people sick, that kind of causal link hasn't been clearly drawn out. Have you studied uh, the effect of these chemicals being emitted in combination? We've studied 
the, 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 the chemicals in terms of emissions are meeting the most stringent uh, health standards and uh, uh, guidelines for uh, air quality that we're aware of. Yeah, but, but you would agree, wouldn't you, that the effect of, the, of, these, the effect of these chemicals in combination is simply unknown? Well, many things are unknown in life. We apply best practice, world-class science in our, in our understanding of our emissions, and that's where we're very confident that uh, the refineries are, in fact, safe. Aside from the chemicals emitted from the plants themselves, there's a vast sea of residue, a byproduct of the refining process, which has to be put... Because the bauxite in Western Australia is so impure, three tonnes of bauxite produces just one tonne of alumina and two tonnes of residue. The mixture contains toxic elements which have to be strictly controlled. Over 50% of the particles are um, less than 2.5 microns in diameter, which means that they travel right to the base of the lung when they're breathed in. And in amongst that very fine powder is uh, uranium, thorium, beryllium, mercury, chromium, uh, vanadium, at Wager Up, this residue is stored in huge mud lakes next to the refinery. If the expansion goes ahead, Wager Up will produce nearly 10 million tonnes of residue a year. That's 300 million tonnes over 30 years. Now, where on earth will you put all of that? Well, currently we store that residue. We, we drain um, caustic material from it so it doesn't enter the environment and the caustic material is reused in the plant. Um, we are looking at alternative applications for residue. Eleven spills in your refinery since June last year. Half a million litres of caustic solution spilled at Wager Up this year. That's not a very good record, is it? No, and it's not acceptable. It's just as unacceptable to us as it, as it is to the uh, public. Uh, at Quinana, for instance, we've spent $10 million improving our systems. We are doing those spills down towards zero. We're not there yet, but what I can tell you is none of those spills have created any damage to the environment whatsoever. Dairy farmer Tony Ferraro took out a full-page ad in the local newspaper to vent his spleen about living next to the mud lakes. This mud lake is it's, it's, it's like a big monster growing. One particular day, our cows weren't black or white. They were red, black or white. Tony Ferraro wants to sell up and relocate, but Alcoa will only buy part of his farm. He's fallen foul of an unofficial buffer zone around the refinery established by Alcoa as part of its land management strategy. Why do you need a buffer zone at all if the refinery has no adverse impact at all on people's health? A very good question, and uh, the, I think we could, we could say um, from what we have today and the evidence, it, is that the real issue uh, with that overall. But there are issues of amenity. Um, the refinery does create noise. It's lit at night. There is traffic. Um, and I think most modern good practice suggests that having some intermediate zone uh, around a facility like that is, in fact, just plain good, good management practice today. Alcoa has, in fact, established two zones around the refinery and offers different deals in those zones to property owners who want to sell up and get out. It's been divisive, hasn't it? It has, it has been extremely um, divisive, and we wouldn't shy from, 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 from that at all. As I said, um, we let the community down in 1996. We tried to rebuild from that. Um, if we could go back and change that and do the land management plan, we differently now we would. Alcoa rents out the properties it buys in the buffer and includes a clause barring its tenants from lodging any claim or formal complaint for loss of quiet enjoyment in connection with noise, odour, dust or pollution from the plant. They like to gag people. That way it looks a lot better for them. You were saying that uh, this is one of the good things that's happened over there. Tony Hall is one former resident who won't be gagged. He's now a prominent local campaigner. I've had to um, sit down and, and really stand a, a, a lot of technical detail uh, in a lot of different areas, whether it's modelling or, or um, whatever. It's, it's something that I've just had to learn.
By day, Tony Hall is a welder, but in his spare time, he reads up on the theoretical science of modeling. Alcoa uses modeling to suggest that there's no health risk to people living near the winery. The level of modeling we're using is a state-of-the-art tool to predict for future behavior from the plant, and it's entirely appropriate. Alcoa are right based on the outcomes of their modeling, but they are not right in what's physically happening. We've got all the amenities, we've got dams, we've got the uh, ocean. Together with other local residents, he's lodged a personal injury claim against the company. Nobody wants to take Alcoa to court. We, uh, who like mine would? We're just simply left in a position where we have no other alternative. Tony Hall and his family used to live in this house here in the middle of town. The year that we decided to leave, uh, we, we had a, a period of two weeks in the middle of winter where uh, my son just continued to cough like violently and um, approximately four times every hour he'd cough that much he'd, he'd, he'd cough till he vomited so my wife would pack up uh, the kids and go and visit um, family for the day just just to get them out and and within an hour or two the coughing would uh, subside uh, dramatically but it, it, Tony it, Hall and his wife took their children to see the same Perth GP Dr. many Dr. other residents uh, had Moore seen Summers. Dr Moira Summers she uh, sent the kids to see um, a nose and, and sort of throat specialists, they identified that our kids had uh, massive polyps growing in their uh, nasal passages, but also their throat. And, and this is what was causing uh, my son's cough, his, his very severe, severe cough, was, was this lump and the itching that goes with it. Even it more worrying were the results of blood tests which were done on the children. My, uh, my daughter had very anomalous uh, lead levels. And at that stage, she, she had serious um, problems with growing pains. Lead poisoning is um, uh, one of the symptoms of is, is, is growing pains, although we don't claim that that was actually the case because nothing was ever determined. Another one was, was very high arsenic uh, levels in, uh, in all of us. And they were detected, I think, in, in the second round of testing we had. So that meant that we had abstained from, from um, fish and, and seafood for, at that stage, six weeks. Yet we had this massive spike of uh, arsenic levels. Tony Hall has become a committed activist, fighting hard not just on his own account, but for those Yaloop residents who he believes have a genuine grievance against Alcoa. We want the truth in this. We want to know what, what has, uh, we've been exposed to. Uh, we want to know what those long-term health effects are. Alcoa denies Tony Hall's claims and is defending the action. A briefing note on the proposed expansion has been seen by Four Corners. In it, the Department of Environment warns that as long as the actual causes of people's symptoms remain unknown, it will not be possible to establish that the proposal will not result in an increase in short-term health impacts on residents with a history of chemical sensitivity. Despite this, calls for a full-scale health review to be carried out in and around Yaloop before the expansion is given the green light have been rejected by Alcoa. What we have said we would support for uh, wage up, if in fact the project is to go ahead, would be to do a baseline study of health prior to the project being commissioned, um, and then to uh, go back and ensure that there aren't adverse effects from the uh, project after that. We, we see that as, as a good investment uh, overall. Alcoa, of course, has agreed to, uh, to, to a health review taking place, but only after, they say, um, uh, approval has been given for the expansion. Is that good enough? Well, I don't think that's good enough. I think we definitely need to have a health study done on that community before the expansion. I do have to do something, because I never myself have put in ten, over 10,000 hours just in work and thousands of dollars, yeah. which has come out of our pocket. Community activists like Vince Puccio are now deeply pessimistic about the future of the town if the expansion goes ahead. 
It'll be the complete demise of the town. Once the expansion goes ahead and they haven't addressed the, the issues, the emission problems, and that uh, you won't be able to live in this area. So we'll end up with uh, a ghost town, basically. What we hope to do is take that line and bring it right down to the old coast road <clears throat> and have the town located in this area. That's between Johnson Road and Riverdale Road. So Vince Puccio wants Alcoa and the state government to move Yarloop, lock, stock and barrel 20 kilometres down the road. It's a radical suggestion and one that Alcoa doesn't take seriously. We're very supportive of Yarloop uh, returning to being a, you know, a thriving uh, town with uh, being a great place to live in and great prospects for people. So just the mere concept of, of thinking of picking it up and shifting it um, is something that just is amazing to even think of entertaining that. My view is that if the government seriously wants to allow this expansion pro program, the only way they could do that in a responsible way would be to now superimpose a buffer zone around the refinery and buy out hundreds more residences and farms um, and shift everybody. Um, and there will be no Yarloop in that case. Yarloop will go. By the end of the year, almost certainly, Yarloop's fate will be sealed. The state government, which declined to give an interview to Four Corners, will have handed down its decision. This has been a disruption to an established community. The impact has been one of really uh, causing it to fall apart. And, and I think this is a very sad, and I mean, it's, a, it's a, an ethical issue uh, in our society. Are we, in fact, going to commit ourselves to industrial development at the cost of where people have lived for ages? I mean, I think that our society is all upside down if we, in fact, say industry is more important than the people uh, in the community. How do you want to see your loop develop over the next 10 years? Tourism. Tourism. It'll be the way it'll go. I mean, you've been down to the workshops. You, you've seen it. It's absolutely fabulous. And it can get better. So will it survive and thrive? Yes. Or will it become yes. a ghost town? No, it won't. It'll thrive. It will survive. There's nothing sure it will survive. And I'm very, very positive about that. Would you live in Yarloop? No. No, no, absolutely not. Would you live there? Um, if the circumstances permitted, I, I'd be happy to live in Yarloop. You can join an online panel discussion about tonight's program from 9.30 tonight Eastern Time, continuing for WA viewers. Just go to abc.net.au slash four corners. I'm Eric Campbell in northern Japan. The World War 